Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Step two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, and both the A speakers. I'm just going to read the same thing. They both wanted the exact same thing read, so that's good. This is on page 44. Starts at the bottom. It says, if a mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long ago. But we found that such codes and philosophies did not save us, no matter how much we tried. We could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. In fact, we could will these things with all our might, but the needed power wasn't there. Our human resources, as marshaled by the will, were not sufficient. They failed utterly. Lack of power, that was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously. But where and how were we to find this power? And we are going to start off with Jackie. My name's Jackie, and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, Thank you. Kristen, for inviting me to share at this conference. Um, a friend of mine has done this, did this conference before, Pete, uh, in Canada. He's um, told me about this conference for years, a uh, few, few years, and so I'm uh, honored to be here. I'm grateful to be here. My sobriety date is April 23rd, 1992, and for that I'm incredibly grateful. I, I, I'm kind of... I'm smiling and laughing, and I, I think I, I might owe Kristen an amends because she get, asked me to share on step three, and uh, about a month ago, maybe five or six weeks ago, and uh, so I started thinking about step three, you know, turning my will, I pray, God, 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 you know, God will, God will, and then, and I was ready, you know, doing the deal, and she called me a couple of days ago and said, is there any way that you could share on step two, and I thought, insanity. I've got that. I understand that. But then I was like, but I had a plan, you know. And that, you know, there's a, an old saying in A. It says, if you want to make God laugh, tell him about your plans, <laughs> you know. And so, um, so here I am talking about um, I came to believe, you know. Um, I was raised in a pretty religious uh, environment, a church, catechism, the whole the whole religious upbringing and um and i was pretty sure that if i didn't follow the rules according to their doctrine that i was going to go to hell and i had never followed rules and rules to me were like someone made a big line in the sand and i would just kind of just put my toe over and then next thing you know i'd go further and further and um i hated rules and um I, i that's just the way i run my life you know so for normal people, um, they would go, that, that's insane. Why do you keep doing those things? But for me, it just seemed like a, a dare, you know. Um, I, I actually, as a young, as a young person, I was in a lot of trouble, um, due to rebellion, alcoholism, and other substances. And I was court ordered to, to therapy. And they, they made me do one of these tests that they, test your personality and over and over and over they'd ask the same question but in a different way you know and i would go this is a bunch of crap they're telling asking me the same question and I, and I finally got annoyed with the the test so i actually ended up doing these connect the dot lines with like making christmas trees and all this stuff at a young age and they um i was court ordered so they went back to the courts and this lady said she's beyond help and i'm like oh just kidding and um and and, you know they called my bluff and and i this is how i started my life you know um insane and um and when i alcohol really was that when i people talked about the first step thank you for the people that shared about you know um the first step because you know i admitted that i was powerless over alcohol was the very first thing for me because my life I always felt some relief from alcohol, and then I continued to drink and continued to drink. But then I did things that I would never do when I was completely sober. And people used to say things like, she's really a nice girl. I don't know why she does those things. And, and like, I am a nice person. 
But if I start drinking, all bets are off. Lock up your kids, lock up your husband, lock up your money, because it, it's all fair game. And I don't do things that way. And I thought once I quit drinking, once I got sober, that that would stop. But what happened is I still had this really strange mind complex, you know. Um, I was sober, but I was dry. I didn't, uh, I was going to a, an AA meeting once a week, not getting a sponsor, not doing the deal. And today I can tell you I'm sponsored. I sponsor women. My sponsor has a sponsor. And, um, and I, I read the big book and I, yeah, I'm in meetings. Um, but when I first got sober, I was just really angry. I was really, to me, this is a definition of an insanity. I, um, I wanted to, I wanted to kill people completely sober. I was like, um, I worked at a 7-Eleven and I had ideas about how to mass poison people who would come by for coffee. <laughs> or if you were less than a size 10 and you're walking in the street, I was going to run you over. <laughs> and, but I was sober. Yeah, I wasn't drinking anymore. And, and it was just one of those moments that I had to just go, wow, but you know, normal people don't think like that. And, um, and I remember it, one of the real reality checks for me was when, uh, my ex-husband and my children were in this playground swinging and I was just so short tempered and had no resource or no spiritual connection because I was pretty, pretty sure that I had already blown all my connections with God because, um, I had already done everything I wasn't supposed to do. I was on my way to hell or purgatory at least. Um, and so I was done and God was mad at me. I was pretty much sure about that. And I remember telling my ex-husband and with my kids swinging on the swing, I said, I could, I could kill all of you. <laughs> and he packed the kids up and walked across the street and I went, that's not normal. I don't think that's normal. <laughs> that was insan- insanity, you know? And, um, you know, and I, and something happened to me. You know, I, I got, in, I got a sponsor and I started to do this deal and I, and I came, I sort of came to, you know, I, I started to, to kind of wake up to reality and, uh, and, uh, somebody told me about a higher power and, and it didn't have to be the God of my upbringing. You know, it was able to be a God of my own understanding. And I thought that was kind of cool because it was sort of a rebellious dig against the God of my upbringing. Like I could choose my own now. Right. And, and then I, you know, so I was able to choose my own higher power. Oddly enough, oddly enough for me, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous to find a higher power. But when I found the higher power, it turned out to be very similar to the, the higher power of my youth, you know, um, and, and I have a kind and loving higher power today who I cho- choose to call God, you know, um, I have a relationship with higher power now that does not fail, no matter what, and um, and I and I attribute that to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and my sponsor and the people in my life. Uh, um, I wish that I could say that everything is always perfect when you get sober. It isn't. Um, it's a lot of work. Um, it's better than it used to be. I know that no matter what. No matter what, I don't have to drink. I know that no matter what, that, that uh, I can pick up that phone. Um, I, I always laugh. I sponsor some women, and they'll say, I was going to ask you a question, but I already know the answer. And I go, what's that? They go, am I crazy? And I go, of course you're crazy. You know, because we all are, but we get a little bit better, you know. And um, and I seem to to be a magnet for crazy people. Uh, and, I, and I breed crazy people. Um you know, I, 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 I do. And, um, and so, you know, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting life for me. Um, what's currently going on for me, I want to talk about what's really currently going on for me. Um, I have a, a, a child who is uh, an act, active in this disease and he was in treatment several years ago and he met a girl who's active in this disease and they breed and we have a little three-year-old grandson who's just beautiful and amazing and uh about about a month ago his mother who's living with us um not my son she uh 
found herself in the emergency room overdosing, you know, in a, with methadone and ecstasy, and I was like, holy crap. So we're looking at some real, real tough stuff, insanity in my life, and, and so it's kind of like, I, I feel like I'm doing this deal, but other people in my life are crazy. And so how do I find that balance, you know? And I have to talk to my sponsor off about, often about how do I find the balance in this? Because I, I have so much compassion for the newcomer. I, I have so much love and help, but all of a sudden when a three year old comes in, I'm like, compassion's out the door. And, uh, and I start to become insane, you know? And, um, and so I had to, I had to really seek counsel on this from, from God, my higher power. And, uh, and I had to just say, you know, God, I believe that you can restore me to sanity. You know, and this is unmanageable. And how I come, how I, how I go to God these days is with my three-year-old grandson. And, um, because the best I can, the best I can understand about God today for me is that God is all loving and powerful. I, I sort of, view myself as my grandson's not total higher power, but I, but I have a lot of power and control over his life and, um, not all control, obviously, but, um, but I love him so much and I'm the master of getting him to sleep. Everybody else kind of tries and tries, but grandma's got it. And, um, and so I, I tuck him in at night and I tell him, Mikel, I love you with all of my heart. He said, you give me your heart? I said, yes. And this is how I feel like my higher power feels about me. He gives me his heart, and I give my higher power my heart. And I get him to sleep when he's, when he's in bed, and I, no matter what he's done, no matter what he's broken, no matter what he's taken, no matter, you know, whatever he's learning, whatever his lessons are that he's learning, I love him, good or bad. And I think that is how my higher power loves me, you know. And... um and, and so, you know, I, when I, at the end of the night, when I tuck him in, I kneel next to his bed and I thank God for the opportunity to be a sober woman in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I thank God for, um, the opportunity to have a sober home and a, a sober environment and a sober mind. I wouldn't say sane always, but a sober mind. And, um, and I'm grateful that I have these tools today and I have resources that I can reach out to. Um, and, and I, I'm incredibly grateful, you know, um, my grand sponsor, I had an opportunity to talk with her a while ago and she said to me, Jackie, when, uh, when the world's hand is heavy, God's hand is light. And I was so grateful for that because the world's hand is heavy because I'm looking at possibly being a full-time mother again. And, uh, you know, we'll see what God has in mind. You know, I don't know yet, but, uh, uh, I'm very grateful for that. I'm gra- very grateful again for my sobriety. I'm grateful for these steps. You know, I understand insanity and I, and I'm kind of laughing cause I was really working on, on God's will, God's will, God's will. And I felt like they said, anyone no, go backwards. Cause I always go way ahead. I, I came into the rooms of Alcox Anonymous through Al-Anon, much like a lot of people I know. And, um, and I was, this is how I do my life. Then I came in like maybe June or July and they gave me the one day at a time book and I wanted to go back and catch up from January to June. <laughs> and they're like, that's why we call it one day at a time. <laughs> and so, you know, one day at a time, you know, I will practice, you know, this relationship with my higher power and, um, and I'll just do this thing one day at a time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for speaking. I I did the same thing um, when I heard that we needed to change some people around. My first thought was, I want Adam and Jackie on step three. And then it took about a half a second to realize, you know, I should probably let God do, just let this thing happen. <laughs> so um, next AA speaker will be Adam. Hey, everyone. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Adam. It's a real privilege to be up here. I really enjoy the conferences like this uh, for an extra dose of recovery because I certainly need it. Um, my sobriety date is April 27th of 2008, and my Draper or my home group is called the Draper Group, and we meet in Sandy 
on Wednesday nights. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I was just, um, thinking about kind of my drinking. It's bookend, bookended by a couple of blackouts. Um, one when I was about 15 and, uh, the other when I was about 35, right before I got here. And the first one, um, and I broke in, we didn't break into a house, but we helped ourselves to uh, a neighbor's liquor cabinet. We had the key cause they were out of town at Lake Powell and, um, we just kind of went in and we're looking to have a good time and we had one. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, you know, I drank too much. And, uh, today I know it's because of that allergy that I have, you know, it kicked in even then. And, um, you know, before I knew it, I was in oblivion and I woke up the next day with a terrible hangover. And, uh, my friends told me a few things that I had said and I was completely mortified and embarrassed. And I decided that I wasn't going to drink again. And that, uh, that la- that lasted maybe about three or four years until I graduated from high school. And then after I graduated from high school, some of my friends went to Utah State and uh, met a girl, and uh, she drank beer, and so I tried it again. And um, the, it was different. Um, you know, I, that first drink kind of hit me, and um, you know I, I felt that effect, and it really opened up the, the window to the world for me. Um, Cause I was always shy growing up and, um, you know, I know that it was basically cause I was afraid of people and, um, I was afraid I wasn't good enough. I was afraid I was going to say the wrong thing or something stupid. And so I just kept my mouth shut and, um, kind of cowered uh, behind other people and, you know, just kept to myself. And, uh, so when alcohol hit me and, um, you know, it was just incredible cause I was able to go dancing and, uh, talk to people, open up a little bit, let my hair down and, um, approach women. And I thought, I, I just thought that was the, the greatest thing ever. And it was my solution. And, um, you know, so I kept at it for a while and, you know, at first it's uh, pretty gradual. Um, I would just party a little bit here and there, but then over time it's progressive. And by the, by the time I was just about done, it was every weekend and it was starting to fill in the weeks or fill in the days during the week. And, um, you know, that's when my life really got bad. And, um, that last blackout was in November of 2007. I went to a concert and I had the intent to get drunk that night. And so I started early, drank a lot and blacked out again. And I didn't remember any of the show and ended up driving home in a blackout. And, uh, that got my attention when I woke up the next day with the usual hangover. That was kind of the same, but uh, the realization that I had driven myself from my friend's house to my home. Um, you know, I, I figured, well, I guess I have a drinking problem and, um, I decided I was going to stop. And, uh, there's a story about Jim that I was reading the other day in the, in the book. And, um, you know, I can relate a lot to what Jim talks about in, um, the chapter called more about alcoholism. So he wrote or said that, um, Let's see if I can find it here. I don't have any of those cool yellow sticky tabs. I was looking for some earlier today, and I didn't find them. Actually, let's go to uh, There is a Solution. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm a little bit lost. But anyway, um, Jim decided he was going to stop drinking, and it didn't really occur to him that maybe he couldn't. And it was the same thing for me, so... Um, I went through a dry spell of about five months where I was physically sober, but I didn't have, you know, the spiritual solution or connection that I needed to kind of get through life. There was just a huge gaping hole where alcohol used to be. And, um, during that five month period, my character defects flared up quite a bit and I was in a lot of emotional pain and, you know, my wife got the brunt of that. She was kind of the whipping boy because I was okay, kind of okay at work kind of okay with friends, but then at home it, it came out and, um, you know, I was just in a world of hurt and through that emotional pain, through that bottom, you know, I was, I was ready to, to listen when I got here. Um, I, I got to Alcoholics Anonymous by way of a psychologist. So, um, my wife was ready to kick me to the curb at that point. And, um, we went and sat down with this guy and after about 20 minutes or so, he kind of had me pegged a little bit. He knew something about recovery thank God. And he suggested that I go to a medium of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that was a real surprise to me because, you know, I just had a drinking problem. I wasn't an alcoholic because I didn't drink 
in the morning. I didn't drink every day, and I wasn't living under the viaduct or something, living at Pioneer Park. Um, you know, like like the guy in the book, I still had a home and a job, and uh, my family was still around. Um, you know, my wife was out the door or halfway out the door, but you know, the kids were still around and things were sort of okay. But, um, you know, luckily I was in a position to, to get here and be willing and I was, uh, willing to listen. And that first meeting I went to, I, I heard someone share about their drinking experience and I could relate and I latched on to a little bit of hope. Um, you know, someone was talking about not drinking every day, but once they start, they can't stop. And, uh, that's the way that I drank. Um, I'd get a couple, feel good, and kind of off to the races. So, um, you know, luckily, uh, by the grace of God, I ended up here and, um, you know, listened. Uh, a few months later, I, I went to the psychologist again to check in, and, and I told him that I was like an AA so far. Um, and he suggested I get a sponsor. And so the next week I did. And, uh, um, you know, that sponsor sat down with me every week and read the book and we worked the steps. And through the steps, I got in touch with a, a higher power. And, uh, that's what really, um, you know, it enables me to, uh, recover from alcoholism is that spiritual connection because I didn't have it. Um, during my drinking, I was self-sufficient and, uh, you know, I thought I could get by in willpower because willpower, you know, served me pretty well in different respects. I worked my way through school, um, got a decent job. We bought a house and, um, you know, I, I kind of f tried to fill the hole that I had through stuff. And, uh, you know, if I could get more stuff, if I could make more money, if I could take that trip to Europe, I'd be okay. And, um, you know, it helps for a day or two and then you just want more stuff, or at least that was the case for me. So, you know, luckily I, I can change through this program, um, I was talking to my wife the other day and she said that I've been transformed and that was really good to hear because the progress just seems so slow sometimes. Um, the lessons are hard to learn and, you know, I get, get presented with the lessons a couple of times if I need to. And, um, you know, slowly and surely I'm, I'm learning, I'm growing up, I'm learning how to kind of process my emotions instead of drink them under the rug. And it's just a real blessing to, to kind of wake up finally, and um, start to be okay with life. And um, I like what um, Jackie said about plans. Um, reminds, reminds me of another saying, uh, life is what happens while you're making plans. And, um, you know, life has happened to me since I got, since I've um, joined the program of recovery and got sober. I've had a lot of painful things happen. Um, I was separated from my wife a couple of different times. Um, I been in trouble at work, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you're a perfectionist and, you know, you get straight A's and you get good reviews at work, then you, you get one review that's uh, not good. And, um, you know, that really gets my attention and, and, again, puts me in emotional pain to where I go back to the program, back to basics, and, um, you know, hit that 11th step even harder so I can maintain that connection with God. Because without Him, I'm lost. And that's uh, the, just the beautiful gift of AA and the program recovery is that connection that I have to higher power. And, um, it says in the literature a few times, faith without works is dead. And, um, you know, I, I, I learned how to take action. I learned how to do the work here so that I could find that connection. Um, I always had good intentions, you know, I wanted to be a good husband. I wanted to be a good father, but you know, the only thing I could do is, is make money and pay the bills. I was not a good husband. I was not a good father. I was a selfish person, and I liked to come home on the weekend, sit in my recliner and drink, and uh, did a lot of that for a lot of weekends. And so it's really cool to uh, to learn a different way of life and to be sober today. Um, yeah, just what a blessing. And, um, you know, it's it's through that connection to a higher power that I've been able to maintain some kind of peace and serenity. You know, it, it varies from day to day, but uh, life is okay, and uh, I'm really grateful for that. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about just briefly here was uh, that that term insanity or disease or mental illness. That was a real tough pill for me to swallow when I got here. You know, I'm, I'm proud by nature, and so it was hard to hear that. And, um, 
um, I got a new sponsor maybe a year and a half or so ago and he, he reminded me that I have a mental illness and, you know, my ego just rejects that. And, uh, I don't like to hear it, but as I've stayed sober, um, it's easier and easier to accept that because things happen and, um, I just get in a lot of emotional pain and I just think, wow, you know, a drink, you know, I know it's not going to work out in the long run, but it's just that temporary relief that's appealing. And so again, I'm, I'm back on my knees. I'm, I'm back meditating and, um, you know, things work out. Um, my sponsor said, you know, a couple of times in my sobriety, uh, during painful periods, one was a most recent separation and the other was earlier this year when I was diagnosed with cancer. Um, you know, stick with us. We'll help you get through and you don't have to drink over it. And, um, you know, he was right and, uh, it was painful. But it's also educational. And, um, you know, I just get closer to the program, closer to my higher power. And, uh, today I have a sponsee and we're sitting down at my house and going through the book. And it's just a real privilege to, uh, be able to do that and to be able to give back a little bit. So this is a cool deal. Um, you know, just a godsend for me and I'm really grateful to be here. So, uh, thanks for letting me share today. Okay, so our Al Anon speaker will be Santa, and um, I'm excited because I've, I've heard her share quite a few times, and um, she is very admirable, I think, and she's got some great kids. So, yep. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Stana, and I am a very grateful member of Al Anon. I'm not going to read all these books to you, <laughs> so don't be scared. This book was inspired by God. I believe that with all my heart. This book is the Al Anon version of it. And um, see all those little tabbies in it? That's what I'm working on this year. It's called Detachment. <laughs> um, I did want to read something out of the, the book of um, Alcoholics Anonymous. This is how the how and why of it. First of all, we had the... Qu- can't even read. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He is the principal. We are his agents. He is the father, and we are his children. Most good ideas are simple, and this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant and the arc through which we pass to freedom. Um came to believe a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Uh, as Adam mentioned, sanity, um, what is insanity? Um, I always managed to be pretty insane without alcohol. That's insanity. Um, I um, had five children and attempted to try and raise them by myself. You need to understand I didn't really raise them all by myself because I had two wonderful parents that helped a lot. And I had great kids. And um, I'm sorry to say that my oldest son became the dad in the house most of the time. And um, trying to do that, work full time and um, go to school full time, that's insanity. And um, I did it somehow. I did it. And it's not because I'm a superwoman. It's because I had determination. Um, the fear of not being able to feed my kids, the fear of how I would end up if I didn't do all those things, um, fear has been a huge driver in my life, my whole life. Um, it's different now than it used to be. little story about um, fear. I... The year between three and a half and four and a half was kind of a traumatic year for me as a youth. Um, I had a lot of things happen. Um, one of those things, I had a cousin who was older than me come to live with us. And um, I kept asking my parents why he was living with us and not with his mom and dad. Well, um, over time, I learned that he came from an alcoholic home. And his mother was my dad's youngest sister, and she was the youngest of eight children. Um, 
the reason he was living with us was because his father was an active alcoholic. And um, this youngest child of eight children, his mother had always been pampered and always been taken care of by everybody else older than her and her, her family. And um, <clears throat> when she ended up, she had three children, and when she ended up living with an alcoholic and all of the craziness that goes with that, she did not know how to handle it. And um, so she started the oldest son would act out. And, you know, I don't remember exactly how old he was. He was maybe 12. But um, how she solved that problem was totally insane. She uh, kicked him out of the house, and he had no place to go. And he would spend nights in the gully in Sandy, and that's where he slept. And I have no idea how this child ate. But as a result, her family decided that they would... um, take things in in their own hands, and they took the children away from her. The oldest son came to our home, and the two daughters went to another aunt and uncle. And um, the family decided to commit this woman to an insane asylum. And back in those days, they could do that. They can't do that now. But um, um, I didn't really know that woman until I I came to Salt Lake to college, and the home that she was living in was just up the street from me, and so I thought, I'm going to go visit her. And um, all my life I grew up thinking that um, adults were not trustworthy because they do things that are scary, and um, I couldn't confide in them because then I'd get punished. That's kind of my own thinking. Um, so I went to visit this this aunt, and, you know, she seemed normal to me. I'm sorry, she didn't seem insane. What is insane? Um, I think that she was just the product of uh, the insanity that comes with the disease of alcoholism. And um, it damaged her so much that she was never, ever able to live on her own. She always lived in a group home. And uh, I spent a lot of time with her. And at one point when I left my first husband... Uh, my dad was helping me a lot, and he and I got in an argument over an uh, up, upright baby grand piano that I learned to play on. And um, I don't even remember how it started, but we got in a huge argument, and it ended up in the piano going to my brother's house instead of to my house. And um, my dad said to me, you're insane. You need to be committed. And if you don't think that didn't push my buttons big time, it did. Because I'd met that woman that didn't appear to be insane to me, but she was pronounced insane and uh, spent her whole life in, in an institution. So I didn't speak to my dad for probably two years, and my mother would call and she'd say, you, need, you really need to call your dad. Yeah, I know, but, you know, I'm still mad at him. And it took me two years to to mend that that relationship. And my dad was another one of those people that whose drinking did affect me when I was ten years old. And I may have told this story before I apologize if some of you have heard it. When I was ten, he he was a weekend drinker and he would go out and get drunk. And he was like Adam mentioned um, when he drank he could dance really well. He did well with the women. He um he had confidence. He talked to people. And my dad was a very friendly, kind, wonderful person, you know, when he wasn't drinking. But he came home this one Sunday morning, and he'd been drinking all weekend. And he was using words I didn't like to, to hear to my mother. His mother, my mother and I, and my mother and my dad were having a conversation about what was going on. And he was being really, really abusive and disrespectful to her. And at 10, I'm thinking, just divorce him, leave him. You know, that was my solution. Um, <clears throat> instead, I don't know if my mother ever had Alan on or not, but she said to him, Stanley, you need to go down to the cafe and sober up and come back, and then we'll talk about it. I have no idea what they were discussing. So um, I lived angry a long time. Um, I always walked around with a smile on my face, though. 
you did not ever know that I was angry. Um, so came to believe that a power greater than ourselves, power greater than myself would be my higher power. Um, from the time I was three and a half, I didn't trust the human beings in my life. So there, I had to find another source of guidance or trust. And uh, that was my higher power. You need to understand that over time, that higher power and my relationship with my higher power has changed dramatically. Um, in order to be, become more sane, I have to change. My attitudes have to change. So I've always had a higher power. Um, how I used my higher power, I used to tell my higher power what I needed and how to bring it to me. And scary as it may seem, sometimes my higher power listened and delivered. And it could be really scary sometimes, too. So I, now I've learned to be really careful what I ask for. Um, insanity. Um, in in Al Anon, we say that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Well, that's what I did. And um, all of my children could tell you that when they were young, I ruled with a pretty heavy hand. And I remember one time um, I had been at work, and my father had called me and told me that um, I needed to come home. And I said, why? And he said, well, because your kids have been sloughing school. And, I mean, the youngest one was like, oh, probably kindergarten age. And the oldest one was probably fourth, fifth grade at the time. And uh, my dad had gone over to the house to look for him and couldn't find How they found out was the second son chickened out and went back to school after a couple of days because he got worried. And um, my dad had gone to the house to find him, and he couldn't find him. So I came home, and they were all hiding from him, of course. They, they had thrown their mattresses out in front of the house and were jumping from the second story of my house onto the ground below on the mattresses. That's insanity. And, you know, none of them had broken bones or anything like that. I have no idea how that happened. Um, that's insanity. And I really did think that I could change all of that through sheer force. I never did. That did never happen. Um, not quite a year ago, I had I spent about 17 years being a single woman living by myself with my cat, and um, um, about well, not quite a year ago, a year ago, December 8th this year, I decided that at the age of retirement I needed to get married again, <laughs> and um, so my life today is. I'm, I'm growing and learning, and I found out I didn't know everything, and I showed you my book. I learned how to do detachment on a daily basis um, because what's mine to do is only mine to do. It isn't for other people to have to do for me, and, it, and I have to allow that other person in my life whom I love dearly to do what they have to do to grow and learn too. If that means make mistakes, I have to detach from that, and I have to allow that to happen. That's a huge new concept for me. Um, in, my, in our dining room at home, I have a um, handmade sign that I won in an auction at one of our al assemblies, and it says, let go and let God. And that's how I live my life. And the learning part for me is figuring out what's mine, what isn't, and what I need to do something about and letting the rest go. And I'm learning how to do that on a daily basis. Don't do it too well at work right now. Still want to control that because I have a plan. You know, my plan never, ever usually happens. It's always my higher powers plan. But what I know about that is when I let go and let God, it works out much, much better. My higher power has um, the ability to tap into resources that I have no idea of. And that's how my whole life has been. Um, I have been in Al-Anon seriously since 1995, and I am still learning lots about how to live life 
on God's terms and not mine. Um, if you say to me that I have to turn my whole life over to my higher power, yeah, that scares me a little bit. Uh, because I like control. I like to be in control. But having a higher power and turning my life over to my higher power frees me to be able to make the decisions that I can make and make the changes that I need to make and let the rest go. And it always works out really well. So thanks for letting me share with you. Thanks, you guys. Um, just sitting here listening to these guys talk. I am, um, you know, was that step one I was taught, you know, I'm an alcoholic. My, I'm powerless over alcohol. My life's unmanageable by me forever, always. And with that step two, you know, I, um, feel really grateful because, you know, I'm, I'm definitely pretty insane. But as far as alcohol goes, you know, I get to sit here today and listen to you guys and be here with you. I have no thought in my mind that a drink would be nice or good or different or worth it or whatever. And, um, you know, I was taught early on that that's for me, you know, that that's kind of that step too is, is, um, you know, get rid of this crazy idea that alcohol has anything for me. Um, and for right now, I'm, God's doing pretty good with that part of my insanity. So just really grateful. I'm going to open it up for you guys to share. Hello, everybody. My name is Mike Hall. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Kristen, uh, good job. I pretty appreciate what you guys have been sharing. It's been, uh, I've really uh, enjoyed it so far. Uh, I've been to Boston down here a couple of times. And anyway, uh, that came to believe to me in kind of means that uh, there's been an experience. If you really read that, it's, uh, it's telling me that uh, I've come to believe in something. And uh, I've been around a while. And, when, and the first time I thought about that, I thought it was about, uh, like she said, you know, about getting that drink and thinking out of my head. And, and the miracle is today that I'm not drinking. That's just a miracle. And, but I came to believe in a power greater myself uh, as a result of, uh, you guys read it in the beginning there. There's a, talks about 44, on page 44, that, uh, about that, uh, the books. What's the book about? How to find a power by which I can live. And that to be a power greater than myself. And that's exactly what this book's about. And then you read it on the page about 62, and that was wonderful. I just love that part. You know, we had to quit playing God. Here's how and why of it. How, why, what? How to do step two. Precise, exact direction on how to do step two. I had to quit playing God. I had to realize that there was a director and it wasn't me. Uh, that I was an agent. I had a job description and it was a principal, something that gave me that job description. And, uh, came to believe, I, I, I really believe the second step is the one that, uh, most people go get drunk on it. And, uh, I've been around a while and I've helped a few folks and, uh, and I know that when I'm being my sponsor and we're talking to a bunch of those guys that have kind of been around here for a while and we start talking about it, that, uh, the whole program hinges on that second step. I found a God here that I wasn't looking for. And, uh, my story, is my story. How awful it was is my surrender, but being, but surrendering is not a conversion. And a lot of folks, I think, that's where they get hung up. They hear these stories, and it's wonderful to have a story. And uh, for me, uh, that's what I talk to when I'm related to somebody that's trying to quit. So if I'm talking to somebody about their higher power or finding a God, the conversion process is about me trying to figure out how to do that. And the, and the precise, direct, exact direction in that, for me, is at the bottom of 62 and the top of 63. And then, the guy from Denver used to say that there's a checklist of promises. And if you've done these directions, uh, these promises come about. And you can read about them in this top paragraph on page 63. And then if you get done reading that, the next sentence says, being convinced we're a step three. And the reason I know that is because I, for the longest time, thought that I had to do the third step twice. Uh, you read the bottom of the ABCs, it says something about the third step. Then you read 62, or 60, 61, 62. Then you go on the top of 63, and then it says, I'm convinced again, do step three. 
And I could never get that through my Kanabi. And I'm dumber than a box of rocks. I really am. And uh, the ones in the bottom of the water, you know, not the ones on the side of the boat, the ones that are in the water. I'm dumb enough. And, uh, and I just couldn't get that through my head. And uh, anyway, so for me today, it's an experience. Step two is an actual experience with a power that today I know is God. And if you're around here for a while, I got a suggestion. Uh, who are you offending if you're talking about God, if you've been here for a while? I understand a newcomer and newcomer meeting, stuff like that. Maybe you're going to run them off or something like that, but you've been around here a few days. Who are you really thinking? Anyway, thanks. Bye. Thanks, Mike. Hi, I'm Beverly. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Beverly. I'm very glad to be here. I, I like this conference. So, um, being here and being in the presence of Al-Anon, I, I can't help but, you know, think about uh, the insanity of my behavior as it affects other people, uh, especially those that uh, that are the closest to me. You know, for a long time, I, I could definitely, you know, by doing the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I could see where, you know, where I affected some people, mainly my children, but... I was not really, you know, I didn't have a clear vision of how how my insane behavior affected other people that uh, on the peripheral. And, you know, as, as I sit here and I hear people share, you know, I, I just think to myself, wow, I just, for a long time I had no, no idea. Um, I think that's... Uh, Part of the delusion people have talked about, part of, uh, I don't know, self-protection. And, um, you know, it's really taken me quite a while through doing an inventory to, you know, take take those uh, people into account. And, uh, you know, today I feel like I have a responsibility that I cannot exhibit insane behavior. I still have moments. Um, I can very easily go to acting crazy because, you know, a lot of times I don't want to be responsible. I really don't. So as an alcoholic, if I'm out of control, then it's not my problem. Um, so, you know, um, coming to believe in a power greater than myself, I, you know, sometimes I have to do it a few times each day. I have to remind myself, I do have a higher power. I have I have a different way to look at this, and all I have to do is um, all I have to do is ask. So you know, my insanity today is my selfishness and self-centeredness. That can get me into any kind of trouble, troubling situation. So I really have to be um, vigilant about it, and uh, you know get out of myself and try to think of other people. And for an alcoholic, it's not easy. You know, it's easy for me to think about me. I know everything that I need. I know what uh, my goals are. But, um, you know, it's it's a little bit harder for me to think, you know, you might have an interest in this situation too. And um, I've really had to, like, you know, try to retrain myself to do it. And it's not easy. Um you know, thank goodness I have these 12 steps, and thank goodness I have a higher power. And I don't have a difficult time thinking of it as a mental illness. Um, I have an easier time thinking of alcoholism that way than a disease. So, you know, it's okay. I, I don't have to be perfect, but, you know, I do I do have to try harder sometimes. So very glad to be here. Thank you. How the gentleman in the back with your hat on backwards? My name's Steve. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Steve. Uh, I got here a little late, but uh, I like the second step. I uh, came to believe for me as a process over time. Uh, when I got here, my Friday day, January 6, 2005, 
And when I got here, I had relapsed for 17 years. Uh, in and out of the program, I had a couple of year chips. I had, I even think I had a four year chip once, uh, where I'd drive her a lot of that time, but not totally active in AA. And so when I got here in January 2005, uh, I didn't believe it would work. You know, I got, you know, I, God graced me with a really good circumstance. I got placed in a situation where I had a lot of male friends. We did a lot of things together, go to meetings and go to conferences. I even went to Kansas City once uh, and to Atlanta once uh, with a bunch of other AAs, you know. So we did things together besides just meetings. But I got a good sponsor, and he started working the steps with me. I started working the steps with him at his home. And for the first time, I really got into it. I got into the steps, and I got into AA. I got in the middle of the boat. I really did through service, through activity, you know, and I started feeling comfortable. But I got to tell you, right at first, uh, I didn't believe it would work for me. I was convinced that it would not work for me. I proved it for many, many years, you know. And uh, so this thing about came to believe, what it means to me is on a daily basis, one day at a time, I'm being taken care of by the grace of my higher power. As long as I don't completely sabotage myself, my higher power will take care of me. It's taken care of me through divorce, financial trouble, uh, health trouble. He's taken care of me through good times, which is even more difficult at times, you know. Uh, newly remarried about nine months ago and uh, going very well. And so uh, my higher power takes care of me. And so I have come to believe that a power greater than myself can take care of me and restore me to sanity. Uh, to me, restore me to sanity means not drink, you know, and not use drugs, um, as well as hopefully eliminate some of the other uh, aspects of my personality and my character that this mental illness is ingrained in me. I believe also, by the way, it's a mental illness. Uh, you know, it's, the problem is centers up in here. Uh, I have no desire to drink. I never think about alcohol. I'd walk into the 7-Eleven, walk right back past the beer thing, or I never think about that. Uh, however, this coming Wednesday, I'm going through surgery. Uh, I've got six and a half years sobriety, and I haven't had to take a single pill of any kind, you know. Uh, my doctor knows me very well. Uh, he's done surgery on me before. He knows all about my addiction. We talk at length about it. Uh, the last surgery did, it was a minor surgery on my knee, got by and through with nothing but ibuprofen. This time it's bone, uh, uh, bone transplant from hip to foot and pins. And I said, am I going to get by on this one with ibuprofen? And he said, probably not. Now I may, I very well may. It's a possibility. I'm certainly shooting for that, you know. But if not, uh, the sponsor knows about it. My wife knows about it. My doctor knows about it. Everybody in every meeting I go to knows about it. <laughs> I get names of people that have gone through surgery recently. You know, I did that yesterday, as a matter of fact. Names and telephone numbers. So this is the deal. If I keep my nose clean and do it right, and even if I have to take two days worth of whatever, you know, or not, God will take care of me and uh, hopefully keep me sane. To the point that I'm capable, that's all I got, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Charles, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Hi y'all. And stuff. Uh, missed the uh, last meeting, but uh, I had step one down pretty good. I'm a drunk, and I screwed things up. It's simple. And I, I knew I had to have a problem. I tried to fix it a couple of times. Uh, I've been graduated from rehab about four times. I've uh, been in AA three times. Been in lockup a bunch. Woke up one morning in the nut ward in a padded cell naked. And uh, that scared me more than anything. And waking up in a bar or somewhere is not knowing what happened. But waking up with no clothes on, scary. <laughs> um, and I had a hard time on this last one to figure out how to 
to get sober. You know, I tried tricks. I only drank this on weekends or didn't drink that on weekdays, whatever, you know. <laughs> Uh, smoke a lot of stuff to help me not drink, whatever it took. And it didn't work. And it came to believe that a, a higher power can relieve, you know, to sanity. That was hard to swallow. It really was. Step three was just too far out of reach. I had to get through step two. And my sponsor told me, he says, Take it word for word, step two, and do one at a time. He said, just, what's the first word? Came. So that's it. And I said, huh? So that's all you got to do. He said, don't drink. Come through that door. Sit down. Shut up. So I did that. About six months worth. Then I asked him about the rest of them. He said, all right, what's the second word? Came to. He says, that's it. All right, six months worth, I realized that my thinking did clear some. I said, able to sit down, shut up, and listen. I heard stories. I heard things that people just, I couldn't believe other people did this. Then it came to me, came to believe. It hit me. If y'all can do it, if y'all have the formula, the system to stay sober, then I, I do, I believe that I can do it. And I have to learn how to do it. And I learn it through y'all by coming through the front door, Sit down, shut up. Every once in a while, shut up. <laughs> and now I've come to believe. The sanity part, once the booze is out, I'm still faced with the isms. I'm still faced with the, uh, the mental problems that I've learned and developed. It's taken me years and years to be an insane idiot that I am. It's going to take years to get rid of it. But uh, the thing is, is that today I'm sober, and uh, there's problems at work, as she was talking about, and there's problems with my family, and uh, and sometimes I'm insane, but there's a higher power, and right now it might just be this room full of people, and that's enough for me today. I'm going to stay sober today because of y'all. So, thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.